Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. We're doing a special month of, uh, as much as possible, we're, there's going to be a few exceptions, of Halloween, Samhain, Day of the Dead, all saints programming. So it's all it's all spooky, it's all monstrous existential dread for the month of October. Uh, and we're actually starting our month of terrors with a panel on Bride of Frankenstein, a classic 1935 universal horror movie by director James Wales. And... Uh, we got a whole panel to talk about it. So, uh, you who, uh, all you out there who are familiar with Talk Gnosis will recognize uh, everybody as uh, they're all returned. But we have uh, Benito Serino. Uh, we have uh, Craig Kringle from Weird Christmas. Uh, we have John Semley from John's being John Semley, <laughs> writer, <laughs> writer, writer, and professional podcast guest John Semley. <laughs> and of course, uh, me and Jason. So, uh, really, really pumped to dive right into this. But before we do, I have to do my commercial for our Patreon. Uh, Jason, do you have the, the, the stopwatch ready? Stopwatch is ready. You okay, ready here's to a... give you the. Okay, uh, wait. Ready to, to set you to go? Oh, yeah, almost. So okay. a little a little backstory. Uh, 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 I have to do this because we can't do the show without it. So I'm trying to do it as fast as possible. Now here's here's the big news, Jason, and you haven't heard this yet. But uh, mm -hmm. Lux01, the moderator for uh, R slash Gnostic, which is the excellent subreddit for Gnosticism, and also the moderator for the very excellent Discord that is attached to our community. I highly recommend everybody check out that Discord. Lux is also doing uh, a really exciting Gnostic project that I can't quite talk about yet but uh, we're, we're definitely going to be doing a show on it. Lux has said that they will donate 40 pounds to us if we can beat our previous record, Jason. Now, oh uh, yes, now we're both, actually, both Jason and I are based in Canada. I think 40 pounds, that's like five, six thousand dollars Canadian. So... <laughs> So this is this is a pretty big deal for our little podcast. So what's what's our previous record? Was it was it thirty seconds, thirty two uh, seconds? I think you got down to twenty eight seconds. Oh my god! There's no way I can do this in twenty seven seconds, but we'll do our best. Okay, so are you ready, Jason? Ready. Okay. One, two, three, go. We can't do Talk Gnosis without your financial support. We literally cannot do the show without you. You can help us out because we're brought to you by viewers like you. Go to patreon.com slash You can donate for as little as a dollar per piece a month for, uh, for, for dollar per piece a month for media. You can put a cap on that in case you do a lot of media. You can do one-time donations. Slash Gnostic. If you can't help us out financially, we completely, under, completely understand these are Gnostic times. Everything's all screwed up. We're all going to die. So what you could do is, is you can tell people about the show. You can share it on your social media. You could like, rate, review it. Take this episode. Send it to your favorite horror fan. Uh, the, that's it. How did I do, Jason? Uh, 34 seconds. No! <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. uh, maybe let's just say here to our listeners and to, to Lux Occulta that uh, we're going to actually do a check of what the last time you did it was to see what the absolute fastest was, because I think that might have been the last time I co-hosted with you. Yeah. Um, so it's possible this is faster. It's possible that my 28-second memory is just a, a, a hazy mirage. Yeah. But yeah, so... we'll, we'll double check. And it wasn't just for the next time. It's the next time we break the record. So so we should be, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll practice, I'll train, I'll work harder, <laughs> I'll get up in the morning, I'll think, talk quickly into the mirror. I, th I think the important thing really is that you exchanged those few extra seconds for, you know, intelligibility and clarity of thought in, <laughs> your, in your statement there. <laughs> Probably, yeah. I think our listeners appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, enough fun, on to the fun. <laughs> yeah. Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, 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 the panels, Bride of Frankenstein, talking. I guess I'm moderating the panel. I'll start. Uh, first off, uh, before you watch this, you should watch the movie. It's only 70 minutes long. Uh, but uh, so much happens in that 70 minutes. I was watching it, uh, as I usually do, thinking today's movies are, are absolute garbage. And uh, also, movies today are too long. So this one uh, uh, is uh, achieved so much in a little more uh, than an hour. Uh, I, I wanted to do this because the the, the movie obviously is, is saying things about religion and using religion uh, religious symbolism. Kind of what it is saying about religion, I think, is is where the, the actual interesting discussion kind of starts. So actually, maybe I'll start with, with John Semley because uh, John, I asked you onto the panel because you have spoken publicly before about that. Uh, this is one of your fave films. You're a fan of 
it. Um, can you tell us, you know, uh, uh, what what intrigues you about this movie? Why you like it so much? And then maybe some of your speculations on some of the religious themes. Yeah, definitely. And I will say, I used to teach a class on horror cinema at the University of Toronto, uh, and this was sort of the film I would I would show for the Universal Monsters Unit. Uh, and part of that was very deliberate in the sense that with, I don't want to say younger viewers, with a lot of viewers, I think it's hard to get people into old black and white movies from the 1930s. Uh, but this one, first of all, is gorgeous. Uh, it has, it abounds in sort of gothic architecture and, you know, a deep monochrome palette. Uh, and it's also extremely funny. I think it's uh, essentially functions as a comedy more than a horror movie. Um, and I guess what I respond to about it is the deliberate campiness of it. Uh, you know, the director, James Whale, was openly gay, and that kind of became more and more of a problem for him as he went through his career. Uh, and I think that this film is so queer-coded and homosocial slash homosexually coded uh, that it almost feels like he's, you know, daring the studios uh, and daring audiences to confront it, uh, which I think is kind of bold. It has a it has a sort of satiric edge. It has a bite. I mean, it feels to me like if if John Waters made a 1930s uh, Universal mm. film for the Lemley Brothers. So, uh, and as you say, it's about you know 71 minutes long. So what's not to like? Yeah, you you know my my wife uh, we watched it together and uh, she hadn't seen it before and she likes old movies um, which of course she would have to right uh, because I hate uh, I do watch things made after 1970 but often grudgingly. <laughs> uh, but um, so not as much as I do, but you know she really enjoyed it, and you know that that was that was one of her most uh, uh, the, her greatest um, love of it was it's beautiful, right? Every frame is gorgeous. Um, uh, the Benito people are always asking you about horror movies. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, tell us tell us your relationship with this movie, and uh, the, if you have any any thoughts uh, off, off the top on uh, on religion and such. Um, yeah, well. Uh... Yeah, this is one of my favorite movies as well. It's one of my letterboxed top four movies to give people an idea of my taste. I think, uh, yeah, um, I think people who know me and my taste in movies know that I really like horror movies from a, a lot of eras, but especially classic horror movies from the you know the twenties to the sixties uh, really are uh, what I tend to collect actually in like physical media. And I love the Universals and Bride of Frankenstein is easily the pinnacle of uh the universal era it's um yeah it's the it's tight and it's in its storytelling the the performances are so great and yeah it looks great it's the one that i think has the clearest um influence from uh german expressionist film there's so many like the use of shadows the dutch angles um the the strict fodden devices that look like they're out of metropolis um the movie Metropolis, not Superman's Metropolis, uh, and and all that, like, uh, yeah, it's so good. And the and the humor, the camp, the like, the high camp, uh, you know, especially Ernest Thesiger, who is the star of this movie, in my opinion, and who previously worked with Whale in the Old Dark House, another really good uh, classic Universal. Uh, yeah, man, I don't know, I I love it. I love the look of it. it Elsa Lanchester. Uh, I'm in love with her forever. Yeah, so. yeah, she, the, she's amazing, and uh, it is it is worth uh, pointing out. I think it is important that that she was uh, like 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 James Whale, uh, barely in the closet as much as you could be out at, at that time in Hollywood. And I, I think that her you know her casting is is, is partly deliberate. Uh, to, to go back to also what John was saying, like uh, about. The, the campiness of the movie, and of course that word is now overused, overabused, the concept is over overused and abused, so to see it in sort of this pure camp form, and also for some of the queer and gay themes, like, I've I've seen gay porn that's less gay than this movie. <laughs> I did that exactly on Letterboxd the other day, where, uh, yeah, I've seen hardcore gay pornography that has nothing on the Brian Frankenstein. <laughs> You, know, you mentioned how much of that stuff got through. There was a fun article I found that talked about how the censors actually, one of the big things they had is in the very opening shot where Mary Shelley is there, that they they told him, take some of that out because you could see too much of her cleavage. And so instead of taking out all the sort of subtext things or even some of the Christian imagery, uh, they, they took out the... Uh, 
the the sort of typical male gaze kind of things, which I thought it's, was almost, it's almost just as well because I mean, for as queer as this movie is, maybe it could almost be accused of having uh, a real but again, campy anxiety about the presence of women in general. I mean, yeah. the, the film begins with uh, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron recoiling at the sight of a woman's blood, which you don't have to, you know, put your thinking cap on to read too much into. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then o- opens into the frame story where a wedding night is ruined, uh, and then proceeds to develop a scenario where two men set about devising life without the sort of meddling intervention of women. Uh, so there, there's almost this kind of like femicidal impulse that courses through it, uh, which I find kind of weird. Yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, I think that's 100 percent correct, John. And uh, and I think it's it's deliberate. I think it's text. And, and I think part of the key is um, the dependence favors uh, Halloween fact. Right. You know, Frankenstein is the name of the of the the doctor not the monster right so the the bride of frankenstein uh the bride of the doctor who's you know in the movie for maybe 15 minutes total right in some ways uh is is the key to understanding the movie um uh, her and her absence and her rejection <laughs> um uh craig uh you uh the, what's your relationship with the movie what do you think about it what do you think uh, of some of the, the the main themes i'm you know I got, unlike benito i'm not as big a horror guy but i been a huge 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 fan of like pre-1950 sci-fi movies forever uh, mm-hmm. largely because of mystery science theater like i got into that and i was like these movies are great they're not bad they're wonderful um and just found whatever i could um so that's more the context that i know it and i i love the discussion out there like is this is this movie a sci-fi movie or a or a horror movie because there's really not much that's scary i mean the monster gets really you know, he gets cuddly really quick, you know, and then you feel sorry for him so quickly as far as he's, when he's going around. And then when you finally see the bride at the end, she's more strange and you feel, I mean, there's, I don't know if people react differently to her screeching, uh, the way that she talks that way, but it actually feels more, I don't know, panicked than to me at least. Um, Anyway, that point being, yeah, it it does seem a lot more like um, a kind of strange science fiction movie to me than a real horror movie yeah yeah i i can totally dig that um so uh so going back to uh some of the religious themes which which again are are pretty blatant but um so there is a jesus narrative in here and then there's some specific gnostic stuff to the point of i'm wondering yeah if james whale uh uh, you know has was inspired by not by gnosticism you know there wasn't a lot of gnostic material in the 20s and 30s but if you had a classical education you're often taught about gnosticism you know like uh you learned about uh church heresies you learned about neoplatonism where they would often bring in the gnostics so you know as as an educated man he would have been exposed to the ideas at some point and 35 is a little bit late paradox Paradoxically, because there, there was a bit of a Gnostic revival in in the at the end of the 1800s, and then more post World War One, right, where you have a lot of interesting people, uh, kind of you know reading what they're reading about the Gnostics. But the, okay, so the religious stuff. So so I would say obviously there's there, there's a parody uh, and a symbolism connecting Frankenstein and Christ, right? We have a parody of the Christ story. So what happens the first time we see Frankenstein uh, is he he murders a man by drowning him. Right. So the movie opens like the Gospel of Mark, which opens the Gospel of Mark opens with Jesus's baptism. Right. The first time you see Jesus, he gets baptized. The first time you see Frankenstein, there's a baptism. But of course, it's a parody of baptism. You know, in Christian theology, baptism brings eternal life. Right. Frankenstein baptizes a man and kills him. And then we have. um this is really funny because uh, my wife was not raised Christian, um, so uh, you know she picks it up ambiently from culture. But I, I said, "Hey, I'm watching this movie for my uh, uh, for the podcast, right?" So she she kept nudging me, be like, "That's that's like religion. <laughs> that's that's like Jesus, right?" And I'm like, "Yes, dear." <laughs> so, so first there's a baptism, then there's uh, uh, then there's a crucifixion, right? We see, and it's, again, it's very blatant. That's when my my wife nudged me. We see the the townspeople capture Frankenstein and put him up in a pole in a crucifixion. Then he escapes. And then we have a parody of, of the resurrection, right? Uh, Frankenstein knocks down the, the the grave marker of what it seems to be a bishop or a pope with um, uh, with um, uh, uh, Christ behind him, and instead of uh, ascending from the tomb, descends into the tomb, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
anyways, uh, uh, and also I would say that, uh, uh, again, it, because we have all these events with the life of Christ, but they're the opposite, right? They're parodies, mm -hmm. they're satires. And I would actually say the, the uh, Frankenstein's time with the hermit is, is a parody of Jesus in the desert with the devil, right? Because who's the opposite of the devil is basically the saintly man, right? What is, what is Frankenstein's temptations to, to be a friend, to be, to be good? Um, so, so, so we have all this Jesus stuff. I've laid it all out, but I don't know exactly what it is that the director is trying to say with this exact parallel. Right, and why why Frankenstein is um, is, is everything that he does is a parody of what Jesus does. Um, I guess perhaps uh, James Whale is starting from in some ways Frankenstein himself as a parody of the Christ figure, going back to the book, right, a resurrected ghoulish Christ. But uh, anybody go off on that? Tell me what it means. I, I wanted to find just one thing. It doesn't really answer that question. Um, <laughs> but, but you mentioned the scene with the hermit, and one of my favorite shots in the movie again to talk about not the queer subtext, but the queer text, is and the hermit, who I believe is a blind celibate monk, and they kind of say, okay, we're going to be friends, and uh, uh, you can see for me, and I'll speak for you. Uh, the camera kind of uh, fades to black as the monk tellingly falls into the monster's lap, uh, and the last thing you see before the uh, total sort of fade to black is a canted crucifix on the wall uh, that almost appears to be slurring. Yeah, yeah. Well, glowing... and it was it was definitely added in to stay. Yeah, in fact, apparently there was an argument about that, like in editing. Yeah, and and it's it's tilted in a kind of suggestive mm -hmm. way, uh, where I, I think that you know, in the same way that the movie has an explicit scene undermining the legitimacy of the monarchs, uh, you know, I don't know that Whale is offering a sort of programmatic analysis, but I yeah. do think he's having a lot of fun in skewering uh, the church in all its sanctity and pomposity. Yeah, like, would you say that that he's basically like, just like doing, doing this the... as as a general uh, satire on religion, right? Trying to make his sci-fi monster movie a, a little bit deeper and just being like, hey, I have some issues with religion, as everybody probably should, <laughs> and uh, and I'm going to have a, a little bit of uh, artsy fun. Is, 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 do you think that that's what he's what he's trying to do? Well, I, I think I think it's contemptuous of the exaltation of religion in the same way that Pretorius is meant. You know, both as kind of a Gnostic demiurge figure and perhaps uh, in the same way as a mockery of the Christian God, as someone who dreams of creating life, you know, not from stitching together body parts, but from seeds, as he puts it. Uh, and, you know, he's a character who, who, who advocates this view that, you know, we should embrace being devils. There should be no nonsense about angels or about being good. Uh, you know, you can read that as a kind of, uh, I suppose, a Gnostic or even a satanic allegory where so much more free and fun to be had in earthly affairs. Uh, but I, I think it's kind of a, a piss take on the very idea that, you know, we would exalt a quote unquote benevolent God who makes us in his own image um, when our attempts to make something in that image turn out horribly. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're spot on. And, um, and, and the... Earlier scholars, uh, it, it, I agree with these earlier scholars, although it's fallen out of favor, really do talk about um, the Gnostics rewriting Gen uh, Genesis in a satirical and in, in a um, in a way to make it a parody, which we very much see in this movie as well as the original novel, right? It's, uh, uh, but in in the book of Genesis, uh, Adam is lonely and asks for a companion, somebody who is like him, right? We see Frankenstein do this both in this movie and in the and in the novel, um, but uh, you know the the sort of demiurgical comparisons uh, are, are quite strong uh, and I, I to the point of I'm wondering if you know James Whale is familiar with Gnosticism um, or if he's just recreating it here right because uh, Pretorius and um, uh, the Frankenstein to a lesser degree uh, uh, are, are parodies of God right just as John was saying they, they, yeah. they say I, I, I want to create life I think um, to, to dive in on this a bit too is like um... I, I don't know if it necessarily if I don't know if James Whale needs to be making a specifically Gnostic point for a Gnostic point to be made. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, like and I think the like what you were saying there before about whether or not the Gnostic texts themselves were parodies or satires or uh, or this, or whether or not this movie is like I think in all cases like all of the above are definitely texts that are in conversation with other texts and other other. Um, uh, uh, assumptions of those texts, like uh, even *Bride of Frankenstein*, 
itself, like in in its sort of satirical fashion, like while watching uh, uh, while watching the movie, I remember having these flashbacks where for a second I was wondering, okay, wait a second, am I watching Bride of Frankenstein or am I watching um, uh, uh, the Gene Wilder? Um, uh, young, Frankenstein. Uh, young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Like in the sense where the scene that Young Frankenstein is making fun of uh, or referencing is almost as silly and parodical as as the satire movie. Um, so it's these like conversations of texts with each other. I think for me, which are like like uh, I think that the stuff that I really kind of dove into, and like the, also the fact that there's this text of Mary Shelley that is that it like is giving us these these characters and the general setting and the general sense. Um, so, uh, I mean, there, that's probably a conversation there too, of like how much, how much inherent uh, uh, awareness was she having with, um, with esoteric texts that are, might, might not have been classified as Gnostic at the time, but clearly have that impulse. Yeah. And, and I haven't done the research and I'd be curious to find out. I do know that she, she was engaged with some with some hermetic texts, right? And she did have some inspiration from from tales of alchemists. And as I said, you know, obviously Genesis and and ideas about religion and creation and the Bible are are flowing through her head when she's writing Frankenstein. It's a very philosophical novel, right? So mm -hmm. she's mm -hmm. in dialogue with a lot of the the philosophy of the time. But uh, yeah, Pretorius and and Frankenstein as as demiurgical fig figure, you know, it's it's quite obvious because again that the, the there's no subtext, you know, throughout, throughout the movie, they refer to themselves as gods, <laughs> right? Yeah. But we know that they're not gods, right? The, the, we know this watching the movie. So they are, they are egotistical fake gods uh, uh, creating an imperfect creation just for the, the sake of creating it and uh, being the lords over it and not having any chicks around. Um, and, you know, even to the point of the, the demiurge in the story wants to create, right? But has to, has to steal the divine spark for, it, for its creation. Uh, and of course, in, in Bride of Frankenstein and Frankenstein, they literally have to steal the divine spark from heaven, right? Or mm -hmm. Frankenstein or the bride cannot live. Um, the other thing too is, is, of course, the real villain of this movie is Pretorius, right? Um, uh, the, where you, perhaps the surface reading or uh, in monster movie style, it would be, it would be Frankenstein. Again, the, the fake God creator is, is the real monster is, is the monstrous one. Um, not the, uh, not its creation. So, so I, I think those themes are, are fairly played and you're right, Jason, wherein um, he doesn't actually, of course, have to know any Gnostic material to make a Gnostic piece of art, uh, especially uh, in this era of the death of the author. Um, and uh, a lot of the times, there's stuff that looks gnostic -y because people are working from the same texts, the same resources, with the same uh, sort of uh, goal points in and stories that they want to tell. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, all the gay, <laughs> the, all the gay stuff. I love that uh, Pretorius, who again actually shows. You know, when you first see him, he's wearing a high collar, right? Like he looks a, a bit like a yeah. priest. Um, and and obviously that's introduced? very deliberate. Oh, He's introduced, ahead. Jonathan, I believe, as a, a, a very queer-looking gentleman. Uh, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. I was trying to remember the quote. I, I thought it was queer old man, but a very queer looking gentleman. And then, you know, the, when, when Frankenstein is, is talking about uh, you, you, why did you lose your university post, right? It, it's not because I was experimenting on dead bodies. You know, he says something like, because I dared to know. And then the... Uh, uh, as John pointed out, the relationship between these two men, particularly if you're thinking about uh, private school relationships in England mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, master and subject relationships, uh, I think he actually refers to them as my old master, right? Um, they, they really do... Like the, again, I, I don't want to call it subtext, right? Because the 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 movie makes it you know fairly obvious that, uh, of of what their relationship was, right? And why why the bride of Frankenstein, not the the, the bride of the monster, has to be taken out. Uh, 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 why she has to be taken out of the the picture, and why um they uh uh uh, uh, uh why Pretorius pushes her away. So yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, my, my answer when whenever somebody says. Oh, who's the bride of Frankenstein in the title? Is it Elizabeth? Is it the monster's mate? My answer is uh, no. It's Doctor Pretorius. Pretorius. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, no. that's a, he shows up, and you know, they're in the middle of preparing for a wedding, and he seduces him back into the life creation game, right? And and that's he takes him from one marriage to another. 
Yeah. It's yeah. funny to consider yeah. the title, at least, or the subtitle of the original novel, you know, The Modern Prometheus, because in a way, Frankenstein fails as a Prometheus because his monster is reliant on the crooked timber of humanity. You know, he has to exhume and sew together those corpses. Where Pretorius is much more convincing as that figure, where he can literally, well, yeah, hew life from clay uh, is his whole sort of scheme. So he, he's also more a more perfect version of the figure being suggested by the first film. Yeah, I, th I think I think the idea of the story of Frankenstein, both the novel and the these two movies, as a kind of failed creation narrative, I think informs the thing that John's asking about, like why. Why is, why is the monster this mockery of Christ? And I think it's because the idea is if we're looking at, if we're looking at Henry Frankenstein in the movies or Victor in the, the novel, if we're looking at him as a degraded creator, right? To the, to the extent that man as creator is a degradation of God, then the monster as a degra degradation of man is that much less than man, right? So he, and the mo monster is a Christ figure, yeah, because he's the creation of a messed up creator. And as a result, he's this messed up Christ and Adam, he's Adam and Christ both, of course. But um, I, I think, I think that's, to me, that's what it feels like, right? Like it's this, it's this sense of like, there, there's a step down from the, the holy and the sublime to the, this more mundane, horror show which is like that's also kind of uh whale's approach as well like so that's what's happening narratively but it's also like filmically there's this sense of uh of the um, the 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 camera even the actors in a way are kind of winking at the audience um sort of degrading the reality you know our ability to believe in the reality of the fiction and start to see it more is as this uh like uh parodic satirical uh, sense, you know, that like it's it's like I, I I just kind of running with where you're going there about that notion of it kind of degrading as it as it moves down. I think that's even happening, um, like at a cinema cinema cinematographic level, at a like a script level, at a performance level, um, not not degrading in the sense of becoming bad, like bad to watch, but just like losing its the the pristine nature of reality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, why we actually touched on the frame story, um, but it's like, why is it there? <laughs> that, was, that was a real thing that they would do. They would they would uh, hole up in Switzerland. There was a year I don't know the year offhand where a volcano erupted, uh, and there was no light, and the weather was terrible in Europe. And the Shelleys and Lord Byron hold up in a, a cabin in Switzerland, and they would take turns telling each other ghost stories. Uh, and that's sort of the, you know, perhaps slightly apocryphal origin for, for Frankenstein itself. Uh, mm -hmm. So that frame, besides the fact that it's setting up this clearly homoeroticized relationship between uh, Byron and Shelley, where, uh, you know, Mary Shelley is just kind of there for, for their amusement um, and maybe from a, a, to serve a censorious function and keeping their hands off each other. Uh, that's based in real life. So as sort of weirdly campy as it seems, uh yeah that's where it comes from i, I think you get yeah and f first of all that is absolutely true they call it uh yeah the year without a summer there was a volcanic right. eruption that caused the presence of uh ash in the atmosphere that uh it was just cold the whole, I, I don't know exactly the year it would have been around 1815 ish um but uh yeah and they got into reading uh ghost stories like they read uh a french book called uh phantasmagoriana which is a translation of a German collection of ghost stories called uh, this uh, Gespenster book, the ghost book. Um, and uh, yeah, John Polidori, who was also present, not represented in the movie, very rude. Um, he created probably the second most enduring work out of that particular ghost story challenge, which was uh, The Vampire, where he wrote about Lord Ruthven, who was modeled on, um, it was his erotic friend fiction about Lord Byron. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I do, well, that's just it. That it's it's actually quite surprising that Polidari isn't there, since uh, for well, the reason you just said, since his vampire story yeah, is he's, he's definitely gay the, fan fiction. He's he's definitely the the least famous of that um, quartet. But also, I think there's an interesting, if not thematic, certainly visual um, reference 
like a mirroring from the from the frame story where you've got Elsa Lanchester as Mary Shelley, yeah. literally physically framed by by Shelley and Byron, and then at the end you've got her as uh, the monster's mate, framed mm -hmm. by uh, Frankenstein and Pretorius, and so I I think there's definitely meant to be an echo, a visual echo of the way. I don't know, men impose their will on women or something. And, and then you see, uh, and then you see the maid at the end rejecting that. And then it all, it all crumbles literally and figuratively. So I guess in that sense, if looking at my degradation metaphor, they've created an Eve who turns out to be a Lilith at the end and it's not sustainable. Yes. Well, you know, that, that again, uh, is probably not, uh, not deliberate, but that's, that's, uh, a very Gnostic, right? Because in, in the Gnostic gospels, Adam is kind of a putz and, uh, Eve is the one who is, uh, sort of the heroine and, and kind of uh, fights back against the archons exactly like we see with this Eve who doesn't, uh, uh, the, who, who does not appreciate her, her, her rulers and fights back against them in, in her, uh, in her ways. Uh, what, There's... so it happens. Oh, go ahead. The, there, I was just going to say there's there's something even kind of Sophianic about that too, like being uh, forced to incarnate and then uh, rejecting that basically. Yeah, well, it's interesting too, since since Eve's also, as Jason said, looked as an incarnation of Sophia or other uh, divine feminine figures associated with wisdom, and it's interesting because she her. Pretorius makes her brain right from scratch. She's not like Frankenstein, who has the brain of a criminal, right? She has a, mm -hmm. a pure brain. She is an incarnate of pure being. So her body is a dead body, right? But her, her mind is completely pure, right? And if we associate ourselves with the mind, that's how many of us think of a mind-body dualism. Again, we have a, a very powerful parallel. Uh, the, between some of this mythology. So again, is it just a coincidence? Is, is he familiar with it? Is it from the collective unconscious? Is it just me making connections? That, that's a very strong comparison. Um, I wonder well, with that how we read her rejection of the monster. Uh, yes. Because there's a way in which you can read it as, well, uh, like you say, her mind is pure. It's unclouded by, by issues of prejudice or aesthetics. But it occurs to me that she's almost the more perfect creation because she not only better resembles a human than the original monster, but she shares humanity's aesthetic biases. And she is immediately repulsed uh, by the monster, where if she was this sort of blank slate, there's no sort of rationalized reason for that that I can think of. No, hmm. it... And uh, uh, Craig, maybe the, maybe you have thoughts on that because it is it's one of the puzzles of the movie. And I had actually forgotten because you know I do really love this movie, but it had been a long time since I watched it. And uh, c going back to this this recurring figure of who is the Bride of Frankenstein, right? For a movie mm. called Bride of Frankenstein, we often think of the the monster, the monstress. She's in the movie for for like ten minutes, right? We see mm -hmm. her at the very end, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's almost a mystery. That's almost that's very intriguing. And and I, I don't think that the movie spells out why she is uh the way she is and why she reacts the way that she reacts right yeah, those no, weird bird-like motions and yeah. sounds and she stays completely sort of inscrutable right like i yes. mean the stories made the original monster sympathetic he's learned to speak he's you know there's all this he's gonna act with motivation now you know um he's not just wildly rampaging but everything we see about her is still completely random i mean it's just like she screeches and she seems horrified by everything that's going on not just him mm, like even right. when she first appears she's just screeching at everything um and i like the idea that maybe her yeah, her brain being somehow pure just, you know, sees all of this as monstrous. Like, it's just not, there's not one thing she's singling out. She's just completely horrified by all of this. And that also, like, one thing I always wondered, like, was why, why, what's the point of the monster killing her and him and, you know, Pretorius at the end? Um, because I, I do think the end gets really hard to sort of trace on easily to like the very last couple scenes really get hard to trace on to any sort of full interpretation of the movie. But the fact that he kills her, I mean, and it's interesting if you watch this, the part, she doesn't really seem like she's trying to get away. She's just kind of standing there and she's after she screeches and rejects him, she's basically out of the movie. And everything then comes back to the monster sort of rejecting 
the people, but she seems like she has voluntarily stepped out almost. If I go well, off I, of a boring like, answer to, to the question of why everyone is blown up at the end, <laughs> uh, you know, this is still like a motion picture production code era film. And I think that this is the thing where the, like a lot of horror films or gangster pictures of the era, it almost indulges a reactionary tendency at the end where the only way for Elsa and uh, Henry Frankenstein to end up together is for everyone else to be destroyed. So the yeah. sanctity of yeah. the heterosexual couple is restored because every conceivable alternative has been immolated. Uh, and I, <laughs> <laughs> I agree that that's not interesting from a thematic or narrative way, but I think it says a lot about the time it was being made and who was making it mm -hmm. and these sort of attempts to, uh, you know, push the film and filmmaker back into the closet a little bit. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on, John, because it is, I mean, it's almost a disappointment where you have this this, this incredibly well-made movie, right? Uh, the, both, both script and acting and shot, um, uh, beautiful and gorgeous to look at. And then all of a sudden in the last five minutes, there's a, a self-destruct lever that comes out of nowhere. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not the strongest writing, and and I wonder if perhaps you know if, if they could make a movie about these restrictions. Although you know, I, I would argue there's lots of good things about making movies that aren't under restrictions. If if that would have been in there, right, uh, or if there would have been a, a more satisfying uh, uh, ending, because all of a sudden you know there's this massive buildup, and then five minutes before the movie ends, oh by the way, there's a self destruct lever. Yeah, I, I think it's. I mean, it's possible. I, this is one I've been scratching my head over as well is, I mean, especially if you're trying to look for, you know, queer themes or whatever in the movie, it's like, well, they, it ends up with all the queer metaphors dead. Um, you can, I mean, I guess you could read it as like an indictment of the viewer or the society. And, and you know, the monster is saying, we don't fit in because of you. This is what we've done. As a result, we three misfits left in the tower here, we belong dead. Uh, we don't fit in. The only people who could possibly survive in this society are the husband and wife who are running off mm -hmm. yeah. into the mountains now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that is part of the point that, I mean, the monster sort of at the last second, he says, no, you live. And he's, which you would think, given how frustrated he is by his existence, he'd want his creator dead. But at the last second, he doesn't want to kill his Frankenstein. It's Pretorius and the woman or the bride that none of them are really going to be capable of either making things that can have relationships or love or or be in love and so it's almost like he saves the two things that could have a relationship um that's the only that's one thing that seemed like it comes out of it at the end um but yeah i whether or not that's the intent or anything but it does seem odd uh, that at the last second like the few words he says are you know you live you know you you can love you know, I like. I remember uh, watching it, feeling like it was uh, more like a going again back to a, to a Gnostic intent of like the furthest uh, the furthest result of what world hating dualism can get you is like. Well, we might as well leave. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, but I I didn't really clock or I didn't really integrate the fact that he does let um, Doctor Frankenstein and Elizabeth go, um, because if that was his thesis, then like you know. Uh, it's like none of it matters. Everybody should just go. Um, but uh, but I did like a, a lot of what he talks about. Like you know he learns the what like what is good in the world through the hermit, like food and drink and and music and things like that and friendship and and then he realizes he can't have any of these things and neither can she. And Doctor Pretorius is like the result or the the instigator of all of this. And it's like it did feel kind of like a like a you know doing a self destruct. And involving the demiurge at the same time, um, uh, like in, in terms of, like that's me trying to make a gnostic uh, uh, point. Again, I don't know if James Whale is specifically trying to make that point. It does feel like there's a nihilism at play, like or a, at the very least a, a somewhat sarcastic nihilism. Um, I, I did want to note the, the 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 point about how this this like self destruct lever kind of comes out of nowhere. But like to me, the whole movie often comes out of nowhere. Like. Um, mm. uh, uh, Pretorius's like jars of homunculi kind of come out yeah. of nowhere. <laughs> yep. um, and it like in that respect, like a lot of the movie itself feels like it's sort of more a series of of entertaining vignettes stitched with this like overarching theme than 
then a, a, a cohesive attempt to link us from one point, from a beginning to an end, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know if he's interested in being taken that seriously, uh, James Whale is, um, or taken that deeply. <laughs> uh, I think it was just like, I, you know, the, the monster needs to die and, if they, and he needs to kill himself and we need a lever. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm reducing it too much. I'm, maybe I'm focusing most, more on the monster's nihilism there. Well, I, I, I think you are... I, I don't think that the monstrous nihilism, the existentialism of incarnation is is not a theme that the director is working in, right? And that is, I mean, I'm answering my question about about Frankenstein as as, as the ghoulish Jesus, right? Because hmm. he, he, is, he is preaching the good word uh, about the monstrousness of being human, about the monstrousness and the existential torment of being incarnated. And that also, when we pick up those themes... That also brings us to what Craig was saying about the bride, right? Like she mm -hmm. has this pure brain. Um, she is she is a pure being that has suddenly been incarnated, and that's why she's freaking out, right? Because to be in a body and to be human is messy and gross and hard, and uh, it entails suffering and is monstrous and causes us to act in monstrous ways and do monstrous things. And I think that sort of downer existentialism is definitely meant to be there, uh, even though you know there's there's a lot of fun surrounding it as well because for those who haven't seen it you know we make it sound it, it's a very fun movie guys <laughs> oh, yeah it yeah. is yeah. so much fun yeah, yeah. Um, does anybody have, again, for just things like, I don't know, like, I liked, uh, and actually, Jason, uh, when you're talking about sort of those disconnected scenes, um, I, I, I find that that's very common from movies of the time, uh, and I, I, I find it uh, also in a lot of the, the German um, uh, the films that were an influence on this, and I don't know if that's just because they're putting together filmic language, or if it's uh, mm -hmm. just the movies mm -hmm. I've happened, happened to be watching. Uh, does anybody have anything on the meaning of, of the homunculus, the homunculi, or what you thought about that scene? Because I thought it was nifty, but I don't have anything cool to say well, about it. I, I actually, I do have a little something that popped into my yeah. head here um, that I think will be a delicious morsel for you, John, because it, it shows a connection between whale and esoteric text. Uh, this is uh, this is courtesy of uh, Al Reidenauer, the writer, podcaster from his podcast, uh, Bone and Sickle. Um, he did an episode on uh, Frankenstein connecting them to the tradition of uh, homunculi. And uh, I'm just going to read from his site. Um, uh, As further evidence that bride screenwriters went digging in some rather obscure texts, the film's portrayal of the miniature king escaping his bottle to pursue a homunculus queen in an adjacent bottle appears to be directly lifted from a legend of an Austrian Freemason, Count Johann Ferdinand von Kufstein, uh, creating homunculi mm -hmm. in 1755, a legend appearing only as a footnote in an 1896 biography of Paracelsus by the theosophist Franz Hartmann. Oh, wow. Okay. That's so, awesome. so, so not only is it a reference to esoteric texts, it's a particularly deep cut, too. So. Yeah. Yeah, so it's okay. So that that does go to show that the the, the they are in dialogue with uh, with some of these traditions, uh, and then getting some inspiration from them. So which doesn't necessarily mean you know like a lot of us here have a writing experience, right? It like mm -hmm. uh, you know I think of the Seventh Victim where the the screenwriters claim that they went and researched Satanists, right? It's it's like you're not going to uh, it doesn't mean that you're deeply diving into this source material or engaging with it. But uh, it is cool that uh, that you found that video that they are drawing from it in, in some way. So, um, also, I, I really like the special effects for that scene because I'm like, oh man, this is so much better than CGI. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there's, I mean, the, just in general, there's kind of that that demiurgic, like if we're saying Pretorius is a demiurge, then just that notion of a demiurge, not just creating, creating stuff, but. Um, uh, um, like specifically creating a system of order, like a society, um, and with rulers and and like that whole that whole sort of um, uh, I, I think I'm rambling in a in a less cohesive way than uh, no. than what we just got. No, yeah. no I, I, I think you're on because you yeah. I think the the one only thing that really made sense with the homunculator me was that yeah he was he wasn't just going for life like like Frankenstein in the first movie just wanted to create a person. But when he mm -hmm. brings up all these little dudes and, you know, they've got roles already and whatnot, there's this sense that he's like, no, I'm going to recreate the world eventually in miniature mm -hmm. or in 
something mm-hmm. else. Like he's going to make his own full world and not just life. At least that's to me was kind of what the suggestion was. Yeah, the yeah. Long-run. And again, a sort of negative version of that world where it's a, there's mm-hmm. an explicit mockery of all these rules. Yeah. And yeah, to put to put another kind of uh, fine point on it, I believe he says in that scene, you know, that his dream is to do away with women altogether. Uh, because again, the original sort of stitched together Frankenstein's monster still demands the creations of human beings who can be turned to corpses who can turn to Frankenstein's monsters. Uh, so in, in this plan, he sort of does away with the, uh, the entire quote problem of maternity. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And that's the point, right? Two dudes who can get together to create life without them. Oh yeah, this is a dude's rock masterpiece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the ultimate dude's rock movie. We got a great dude's rock panel to talk about it. So um it is funny. Now I'm just gonna say funny things my wife said when we're watching this because you know, I also she would have watched it with me regardless, but it's uh she has a gender studies degree. So I'm like, oh hey babe, there's a bunch of gay stuff. Um so, so um like in the opening scene like uh like john semley was saying right like the, it, it starts right away because she actually nudged me she's like are those two guys gay <laughs> and i'm like that's definitely how they're coming across isn't it <laughs> yep so, yeah so that's that that's moment one one of my favorite things too about pretorius again this is just random observations but what a decadent he is in that sort of coy way where you mm. know Oh, gin, my one weakness. Oh, a cigar, my one weakness. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll accept literally any indulgence while claiming that it's the only thing that will undo him. <laughs> yes, he just likes, like, he sort of has an almost Oscar Wildean vibe, like everything oh, is kind of... I, he's a dandy uh, fop, I mean. Yeah. It, it's yeah. So yeah. yeah. Uh, like, I mean, the the one point, I mean, I, there was a few times where I laughed out loud, but literally, I think when the bride first gets, like, is the, the, the table tilts up um, and uh, uh, they, they take off, like, they start to pull off some of the bandages and then Pretorius, and I won't do the voice because I don't want to sound uh, dismissive, but he just, he, he just proclaims the bride of Frankenstein in such a, uh, like, a dandy fop. Uh, 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 like playful manner that it's like I I laughed out loud. I wasn't laughing at him, I was laughing sort of with his joy of this of this yeah. this creation he's been made. And the um, other thing, of course, the first thing they do right after that is they dress her up, right? That's, that's yeah, cool. yeah. They put her in robes, like mm-hmm. and the, like the the next shot, they're holding the robes out like for mm-hmm. a portrait, like yeah. you know, <laughs> like the. Which, why would you do that? Like, there's no, no one's taking a picture. Nobody's painting anything. What's, like, it's just beautiful because it is, you know, because that's what you do, you know? Um, like, yeah. All right. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for not doing the voice because even just doing an imitation of Pretorius would probably be a hate crime in, <laughs> in today. Yeah. 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 <laughs> No, I'm definitely not interested in, in doing that and in, like, in dismissing any of that either. Um, uh, which again goes back to what I think so great about this too is that like it it's a lot like through the coding it allows itself to to go to these places um, in ways that can allow uh, some members of the audience to dismiss it or ignore it or or uh, defuse it for themselves. Meanwhile, it's still like living its best life, you know. Yeah, the, um, the reactionaries can say, "Oh, this is just a movie about." Uh, two men with pronounced cheekbones constantly touching each other's wrists and the small of their backs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, I think there is, I didn't do any reading, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm sure that in filmic studies, there, there's quite a bit on this, uh, uh, on this movie, but I didn't do any reading. I just wanted to do a pure, but I, you know, I did scan the Wikipedia where I think even there, they said something like James Whale said that Pretorius was deliberately, you know, he wanted to have a, a campy, bitter, like old queen, uh, uh, it was, was what he was aiming for in, in, in this character, in, in this direction mm. of his character, creation of the character. So, so, uh, again, you know, for, uh, uh, for 1935, um, like I, I, uh, I hate to repeat myself, but I, I, I hate to call it subtext. <laughs> but, but you're right. Of course, the movie works on different levels, and you know, millions of people saw the movie. I believe it was a big hit. It continued to be a big hit. It was on late night television for decades, and probably still is. So, lots of people watched it and appreciated it on lots of different levels. Exactly. 
Yeah. So we're at we're at uh, the, the 50 minute mark now. So uh, I figure we shouldn't go longer than the duration of this movie. <laughs> 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 I could. I could talk about it all night, so we don't have to end right now, but perhaps if we want to start getting into that home stretch, you know, anything anything that's sort of bubbling in our minds about the about the film that we want to talk about. Uh, I, I have a I have a, a thought or a question, but it's going to be a pretty big, is, is it might be a whole different can of worms, might lead us away from the movie. Okay, Open that up, that can. Why, why would they choose, or sorry, why would George Lucas choose to reference Bride of Frankenstein when we first see Darth Vader in the costume in episode three? Because that was that's the thing that struck me while in my rewatch was that uh, the bride's um, you know uh, like metal frame comes down, and then it as it tilts up and uh, and like she's still bolted in there, it feels like George Lucas is doing a specific reference to that movie. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, like so. I mean, again, it doesn't matter whether or not George Lucas meant it. Uh, or if he was specifically trying to suggest or imply something, but let's just question: What could he? What could a possible interpretation connection be between Darth Vader in Episode Three and the Bride being uh, uh, incarnated on this uh, in this new moment before she screeches? I'll start with it's definitely deliberate, right? Because uh, you can go through, <laughs> you can go through you know, Lucas, uh, and and sometimes he, I, I'm sure he's doing it. I'm not actually going to answer the question, but I'm sure he's doing it sometimes just to have fun because he's a movie geek, right? Yeah, uh, he's a geek in lots of ways. So he's like, so you can find you, there's more than enough articles online where you can find specific shots from his favorite movies in in, in Star Wars. Um, so it might just be that. But does anybody have have anything? If there's a deeper meaning there. I would say if you want to look for something, I mean, it's a, I mean, there's the messed up family relationship, right? I mean, just kind of like you get the, the mm -hmm. messed up marriage here that's monstrous and not going to work out just like, you know, like, like they're having in that, at the end of that one. Um, I could see that. So I definitely thought Frankenstein, I admit when I, like, I got the Frankenstein catch in the, the Vader movie back then, but I'd forgotten that it was actually from Braid of Frankenstein. I, I, I thought that was just Frankenstein. But, uh, well, and it might, but I like, remember. It, uh, yeah. it honestly might be both, it, you know, um, yeah. like it may be the, the bride's uh, uh, table tilting up was a, it was just a tad more iconic and therefore yeah. more in Lucas's You're memory. You're definitely right though. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It's, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, maybe if like, uh, uh, like Vader is being, you know, forcibly incarnated in this like artificial body, um, and she's been forcibly incarnated in this, mm -hmm. in this in, like artificial body, uh, with maybe without that sense of tragedy. Like he, it, there's no, you know, he had, like we haven't spent two and a half movies watching him whine his way to, or watching her whine her way to falling yeah. into this body. But uh, um, yeah. Well, you know, Jason, you might be on to uh, a thread there that's deeper because yeah, Lucas got more into mysticism as the years go by. So, you know, kind of famously, uh, 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 people often explain the work of Joseph Campbell through Star Wars. Is everybody familiar with that? Mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah. but what happened was is Lucas wrote Star Wars first and then uh, noticed that it's similar to the work of Campbell or Campbell noticed that it was uh, close to the work of Campbell. Uh, so do people know what I'm saying? As in, mm -hmm. like, it's retroactive. So Lucas actually got more interested in Campbell and Jung as the years went by. Uh, and kind of got more interested in mysticism. Mm -hmm. So he might, by the time we're at the prequels, be making a deliberate point. However, I, and I think I think the monstrousness uh, and the incarnational things, I think you're spot on, Jason. I think that is mm -hmm. also what he's aiming for. As well as just some, I'll try to do by Lucas. <sighs> And I like this movie, and I'm gonna. Isn't this a great George Lucas impression? And I'm, <laughs> I watched it when I was seven, so I'm gonna take a shot from it. Because you know, Lucas is just yeah. You know, if you're gonna go into psychoanalysis, right? He's just trying to recapture being six. It's what he's been trying to do his mm -hmm. whole life, uh, going to the to to the um uh, the, the afternoon matinees, right? And then he just spend the rest of his life trying to recapture that. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, but he does deliberately, you know, and, th and this is a game that, that that the internet likes to play. He deliberately does like to take some some obscure shots and and some very famous shots from from the things that that, that have inspired him and stick him in his films so so mm -hmm. it could be it could be on that yeah uh anything else on bride of frankenstein before we before i pull the before we pull the lever 
to pull the lever. <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, we we belong dead. I think I think we can all agree. Everyone, we belong dead. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you, Benito. I think that's a perfect place to well, <laughs> to end. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this, this this isn't our our Halloween oeuvre of um, yeah. uh, of episodes. So yeah, uh, that that would definitely fit. I think. <laughs> it's it's a perfect start. Okay, plugs before we depart. Um, give me one sec here. Uh, Benito, Benito, you go first. I'll throw yours up there. We okay. have Linktree slash Benito Serino. Yeah, um, you go there. It's got everything for me, plus everything for my podcast, Apocrypals. Um, uh, things you can find on there include, uh, if you go to my Gumroad store, which is on that link, uh, you can find I just put up a PDF of my book, uh, The Alphabet of Monsters which is a rhyming alphabet of classic movie monsters that I, if you enjoyed this episode, you will surely enjoy. Um, so that's on there. Uh, yeah, Poker Pals, my podcast with Chris Sims that we do about um, biblical and extra biblical texts. Um, we're heading into what we call Haints and Saints territory. We're going to be covering uh, the, the, the Apocalypse of Paul, where finally St. Paul goes to hell. Um, and uh, we just decided this is an exclusive to this podcast. We're going to do some stories of the Rabbi Baal Shem Tov um, oh. for this month, where we're going to see a rabbi fight a werewolf, which I think is what everyone wants. Um, so check those out. Those will be coming up in the month of October. Very, mm. very exciting. And uh, I, I suspect perhaps next year we'll have you on for a panel for the movie Cemetery Man if we're looking for a good existential horror movie. So oh, nice. yeah, for yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Um, uh, okay, uh, up next, uh, Craig, give us your plugs. Sure, weirdchristmas.com. That's where you can find almost everything. Uh, social media accounts, any, pick your poison. I share tons of weird vintage Christmas cards, um, holiday appropriate. Uh, and then also just a little unrelated, but you never catch a wide net, especially with this group. If you like Gene Wolfe, check out the Rereading Wolf podcast. Because mm. that's, that's one the other thing I'm doing at the same time. Yeah. Not related to Christmas, uh, but... I uh, super quick segue, but oh, I, when sweet. I was in a used bookstore um, the other day, I found this Excellent. in the yeah. So I was like, well, I have to snag that quick. There you it's, go. Uh, for the podcast listeners, it's uh, Gene Wolfe's "The Earth of the New Sun," which is, I think, like kind of a, a coda to the yeah, to the, yeah. or book five. Yeah. You can call it book five or book five exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John Sumley, I understand that you have some new articles out. Uh, the first one is on BuzzFeed News. If you could tell us a bit about that. Oh, yeah. I went to a uh, 5MEO DMT retreat in Jamaica for work where uh, I reported on the emergency uh, segment tourism. Uh, and also myself smoked uh, lab growth synthesized, which was a very aesthetically and emotionally and intellectually novel experience, to say the least. Um, so check that out. A friend of mine, uh, Edward Millar, he and I just recently wrote an article about the te current teenage obsession with the Unabomber that is transpiring online. Uh, but yeah, if you want to keep track of my writing or various inanities, you can, as Melvin Bragg says, at the end of every episode of In Our Time, follow me on Twitter, uh, at John Semley Dawson. Fantastic. Uh, uh, Jason, anything uh, going on? We have JasonMemel.com as well as SageTheater.com. Anything going on for Sage? Uh, well, I mean, as we continue to pivot in the world of the pandemic, um, we maybe have some shows happening in uh, in January 2022, but uh, fingers crossed that that a fifth or sixth wave doesn't crest upon us, um, and uh, and some other uh, sort of smaller projects. So just keep your eyes open at sagetheater.com and jasonmemmel.com, and hopefully uh, we'll have something to tell you here soon. Perfect. And finally, mine is mylandmeditation.substack.com. Um, my uh, part-time job is uh, teaching meditation, teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction. I have uh, uh, training in, in that field, uh, but sort of uh, as a way to make sure that I'm meditating and uh, teaching meditation and doing something that's not for money, because sometimes, I, again, I feel like he's taking money for it, but I need to stay alive. I do mylandmeditation.substack.com. So it's, uh, it's free secular meditation. You don't have to be religious. 
You don't have to be experienced. You don't have to be anything. You just have to be you or not you. You just have to exist or not exist. Um, <laughs> we do it. We were doing it in person in Montreal. Then we switched over to online for the pandemic. Uh, you know, things are still pretty touch and go. We took a summer break and we're coming back. So I, I think we're probably just going to do it online. Though we've had enough demand that when we go back to doing it in person, it will be hybrid. We will be streaming those sessions. So it's Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Montreal time, New York time, the Eastern time. Uh, so feel free to check that out. It's good for both beginners and experienced meditators. We meditate for about an hour, but if you find that intimidating, if you're new, we flow through a few different uh, techniques. Plus, you're in your living room or your bedroom. You know, you're you're safe. You're safe. And if you don't like it, you can just turn it off. So feel free to check that out. MyLandMeditation.substack.com. Uh, Dudes Rock panel, thanks so much. Uh, this was amazing. And uh, thanks so much. So uh, uh, that's it. Farewell. Pulling the Great. lever. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Pulling the lever. <laughs>